we are doing a study on the nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. And that's the gift we're going to be studying today. The gift of the word of knowledge. Now, what is this gift? It is the supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit of certain facts in the mind of God. The word of knowledge reveals facts concerning things past or things present. You cannot have knowledge of the future, can you? You only know about things that have happened in the past or are currently happening in the present. Jot this scripture down, James chapter 4, verse 14. The word says, you know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, do you? And aren't we glad that we don't know some of the trials, tests, problems that we're going to have to go through tomorrow, next week, next month, in the coming years? So you don't have knowledge of the future. You only have knowledge of what has happened in the past or what is currently happening in the present. The word of knowledge is one of the three revelation gifts. What were they? Do you remember? Get out your sheet, that first sheet that I gave you last week, page three. That's going to be your guidebook. As you read the New Testament, the Old Testament, Get that page out and read the stories and be able to know which gift of the Holy Spirit is in operation through that, that person that you're reading that story about. The three gifts which reveal something, the three revelation gifts are the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirit. And all nine of the gifts of the Spirit lift up Jesus, point to Jesus. The gifts do not draw attention to themselves or to the person operating in them, but they always point to Jesus. People mistakenly say, I have the gift of knowledge. No, if this was your gift, you could operate in it anytime you choose to. The gifts of the Spirit are not yours, but the Holy Spirit anoints you to operate in these gifts as he wills, as he chooses. You cannot get up and go out in the morning and say, I'm going to work a miracle today. You can't do that, could you? Boy, wouldn't it be great if we could. You can't get up and say, I'm going to lay hands today at church on everybody that's sick and they're all going to get healed. If you can do that, wouldn't that be awesome? In your, if you can do it in your own power, but no, the gift of the Spirit only operates through you as the Holy Spirit anoints you to operate in these gifts. So the gift of the word of knowledge, you don't have this gift. It is not your gift. It is not the gift, and this is my gift of the word of knowledge. No, the word of knowledge is just that. It is a word of knowledge. It's not all knowledge. Only God has all knowledge. He knows all things, but he imparts a word of knowledge to you that he wants you to know. The word of knowledge is not intellectual knowledge. It's not something you can learn by reading books. No, it is not intellectual knowledge. Now, let's go to the word. Let's look at some examples of this gift in operation. We're going to... Every week we're going to go to the New Testament. We're going to see these gifts in operation in the Old Testament and through the life and ministry of Jesus when he was here on earth. Now, New Testament example, Ananias. In Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 12, there was a certain disciple named Ananias. And to him, the, the Lord said, well, how did the Lord speak to this man, Ananias, through a vision? And he said, behold, look, I'm here, Lord. The Lord said to him, arise, get up, go to the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayed. And he had seen in a vision. A man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Now notice verse 10 says Ananias was a disciple. Ananias was not a great prophet. He was not one of the
the apostles. No, he was an ordinary layman, an ordinary disciple. So ordinary people are used to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, there's no way that Ananias could have known that there was a certain street in this city called Straight Street, like you may live on Fifth Street or Church Street. Well, in this city, there was a church named Straight Street. And there was a man inside this certain house on this street named Saul who was praying at that very moment. Now, there is no way in the natural that Ananias could have known all those facts. Could, could he? No. And the only way Ananias could have known that the Holy Spirit wanted him to go to lay hands on Saul that he might receive his sight. The only way he could have known that was by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. It was revealed to him through the gift of the word of knowledge. The Holy Spirit did not reveal to Ananias every person in that city who was praying at that very moment. The Holy Spirit did not reveal to him every person that, that lived on the straight street that was praying at that time. No, the Holy Spirit only gave him a word of knowledge about one man who was praying at that specific time. Now, if you're taking notes, jot this down. The word of knowledge comes from several different, different methods. By an inward revelation, number one, through tongues and interpretation, and we'll get to these gifts through prophecy, the third way, through an angel appearing and speaking to someone, through a dream, or number six, through a vision. And that's what this disciple Ananias had. He saw in a vision. So, Peter, now let's look at an example of Peter. Peter went up on the housetop to pray. He was hungry. He, while they was fixing the meal, he was praying. He fell into a trance. And he saw a vision of all kinds of unclean animals. And the, the word of the Lord came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, not me, I'm a good Jewish boy. I, this pork has never crossed my lips. You remember when we talked about it before? This was the original, pigs in a blanket. In Acts chapter 10, verses 19 through 21. While Peter thought on the vision, that's how this revelation came to him when he saw a vision. The Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, said unto him, Behold, look, three men seek thee. And therefore, arise therefore and get thee down. Go with them, nothing doubting, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, look, I'm he who you seek. I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come looking for me? What is it you want? So while Peter was thinking about the meaning of this vision of these unclean animals in this sheet that had been let down from heaven, the Holy Spirit spoke to him, gave him a word of knowledge, telling him that three men were downstairs asking for him, looking for him. Pete had no way of knowing that in the natural. But the Holy Spirit revealed it to him through the gift of a word of knowledge. Let's look at another example of Pete operating in the gift of word of knowledge. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Oh, I wish we had time to read these passages, but we don't for the sake of time. That's why I put them in your handout. You take the time to go back, read these passages, so you'll get an understanding of the gift that we're studying. So, in this story, in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and his wife Sapphira had sold some land, and they agreed together that they was going to pocket some of the money. They were going to keep some of the money that they got from the sale of this land, but that they was going to lie to Peter and the disciples in the church and say, hey, we're bringing you all the money that we got from the sale of our land. And so when they came in, Peter knew by the Spirit that Ananias was lying. And he said, why has, has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You've not lied unto men, but unto God. And he fell down 
wasn't dead. And so the men wound him up, took him out, buried him right then. Then three hours later, his wife, Sapphira, came in. She didn't know what had taken place. Now think about it. Here we are it, it today. This church service had lasted three hours. It was still going on. That's one miracle. We don't want church services to last over an hour, do we? We want to beat the Baptist to, to the buffet on Sunday. But this service was lasting over three hours. The second miracle is nobody gossiped, nobody ran and told Mrs. Sapphira what had happened to her husband. So two other miracles happened in this story. And so she came in, and she said, Pete said, hey, tell me, did you sell the land for this amount of money? She said, yep, that's what we got from it. And he said, the feet of those that carried out your husband, they're at the door, they're going to carry you out and bury you. She dropped dead immediately. The moral of this story is don't do what they did. Do not lie. They lied, and they died when they lied. Wow. If Christians today drop dead in church because they have been lying, we'd have a lot more empty seats in church, wouldn't we? Woo! Now let's look at some examples of the Lord Jesus operating in the gift of the word of knowledge while he was here on earth. And Jesus operated in all nine of the gifts except tongues and interpretation. Why? Because Jesus operated under the Old Covenant. And under the Old Covenant, these two gifts were not in operation yet. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had not been sent to indwell mankind until Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. So, and speaking in other tongues is the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon the prophets, and they would prophesy, and then the anointing would lift off of them, and then they were no different than any other ordinary man. So the Holy Spirit did not come to indwell believers until Acts chapter 2, after Jesus had ascended back to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Then... He sent the Holy Spirit to earth to indwell believers. So keep in mind, as we study these gifts, Jesus operated under the Old Covenant. Now, John chapter 4, verses 5 through 19 and verses 28 through 30. Jesus came to the city of Samaria. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired. He sat down at the well, and everybody thinks he's all-knowing. He, he knows all things. He can do all things. He, he's God. No, he laid aside his deity. When he was, came to earth, born as a babe in, in Bethlehem's manger. So he got tired. He got hungry. He was not all-knowing while he was here on earth. He was tired. He sat down at the well. Verse 7, a woman uh, from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me to drink. Verse 9, the woman said, hey, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. You Jews hate us. So why are you asking me for a drink of water? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Verse 11, the woman said, hey, you don't even have a bucket to draw water from this well. How are you going to give me a drink of this living water you're talking about? Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinking of this water, this water from this natural well, shall thirst again. But whoever, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of, of water. Bring it up into everlasting life. Verse 15, the woman said, Sir, give me this water to drink. Verse 16, Jesus said, And her go, and call thy husband, and come hither. The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For the, thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sense, Thou truly, or you're telling the truth. 
about that. Jesus is operating in the gift of the word of knowledge when he told her this. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Son, I perceive that you are a prophet. Verse 28, she left the water pot, went into the city and told me in verse 29, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Now, Jesus didn't tell her everything she had ever done. He only told her about one circumstance in her life concerning the men in her life. So Jesus was operating in the gift of the word of knowledge. Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 4. A man was brought unto Jesus who was sick of the palsy. Jesus, seeing their faith, the men's faith that brought this man to Jesus. Jesus, seeing their faith. Then he spoke to this man and he said, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemed. Verse 4, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? What did Jesus say? He knew their thoughts. You say, oh, yes, but Jesus was all-knowing. He knew all things. No, when he came to earth, like I told you, he laid aside his deity. His Godhead. He came to earth as a man. He was tempted in all points just like we are, yet he didn't sin. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we have not a high priest, speaking of the Lord Jesus, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was not all-knowing while he walked here on earth. For example, in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14, Jesus was hungry. And at the well, he was thirsty. So now he's hungry. He saw a fig tree. He walked up to that fig tree to see if it, that tree had any figs on it. Verse 13. But he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now, notice Jesus answered the fig tree. That means the fig tree was talking to Jesus. Think about it. Think about it. Before Adam fell, Adam could communicate with all of the animals. Why do you think Eve wasn't surprised at the serpent? And coming to her in the garden, they carried on a conversation. Why was Balaam not surprised when his donkey started talking to him? Because the creation has a voice. The trees of the field clap their hands. The stalks of corn, they shout for joy. They also sing, the scripture says. Creation has a voice. We just don't have our spiritual ears open to hear what they're saying. But Jesus heard what this fig tree said because he answered and said it. I don't know what the fig tree said to him, but it must have been a small alec remark, something like, ha, ha, fooled you. You're not going to get any figs off of me. But it, Jesus was not happy with that fig tree, so he answered that fig tree. He said that it no. I'm not going to get any figs up from you, and neither is anybody else. And that fig tree was cursed. It dried up from the root. Now, Jesus was not all-knowing while he was here on earth. If he was, he would have known from a distance that that fig tree didn't have any figs on it without leaving the, the road and walking all that distance to where that fig tree was. Now, is Jesus all-knowing now? Certainly he is. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is all-knowing now, but when he was here on earth, he was not all-knowing. He operated in the gifts of the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, working on miracles, gifts of healings, all of them except tongues and interpretation. Now, let's go to the Old Testament and look at some examples of the word of knowledge from the Old Testament. The prophet Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 12. 
the king of Samaria had come against Israel and the children of Israel's army and the king of Israel. And so this king of Syria had planned to attack the, the army of Israel. And the king of Syria would map out his battle plan. And he had said to his generals and commanders and captains, look, right here, we are going to attack the army of Israel from this spot. Verse 9, but the prophet of God warned the king of Israel, saying, don't go to this place because that's where the Syrians are. That's where your enemies are. Verse 10, the king of Israel would be saved time after time because he listened to the prophet of God's warning. Verse 11, the enemy king of, of Syria was so upset, he asked his servants, who among us is a spy for the king of Israel? There's got to be a spy among us informing the, the king of Israel of our battle plans and our strategies and where we're camped. Verse 12, the servant said, hey, no one is a spy, but king, even the words that you whisper in your bedroom. Elisha the prophet knows what you said, and he tells the king of Israel. Now, how did the prophet Elisha know where the enemy army was? By the gift of the word of knowledge that was in operation through him at that time. This happened several times. Notice the words of verse 10. And saved himself there not once nor twice. In other words, this just didn't happen once or twice, but time after time after time. Verse 11, it happened so much, so often, that the king of Syria asked his men, Hey, which one of you is a spy for the king of Israel? Isn't this a great story? I love these stories in the Old Testament. You don't have to waste your time reading an adventure novel. Just crack the book. The Bible is full of adventure stories, suspense stories, romance stories. Whatever you want to read, the Bible is full of stories. Get hooked on the book. Now, let's look at another example. Samuel, the prophet Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 9 is the story of lost donkeys which belong to Saul's father, Kish. Now, Saul later became king. And this is his father, Kish. His donkeys were lost. And we think, huh? What? So what? That was a big deal in Bible days. That was their transportation. It'd be like you going out to your garage and no cars are in your garage. And donkeys were also beasts of burden. They carried the goods through, from where that, that person was traveling. It'd be like you walking out in your truck with the U-Haul attached to it was gone. And so it was a big deal in Bible days for these donkeys to be lost. That was their livelihood. So Saul's father, Kish, sent Saul and another servant to go and search for these lost donkeys. But they could not find them, verse 4 and 5 tells us. And then in verses 6 through 14, the servant said this to Saul, Hey, why don't you ask the prophet of God where they are? So they come to the prophet Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 15 through 16. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, the Lord told the prophet Samuel through a word of wisdom the day before Saul came that he was coming tomorrow about this time. What does the word of wisdom do? It reveals facts concerning the future that haven't happened yet. We'll study that gift next week. So, in verse 20, God gave Samuel a word of knowledge that the donkeys which had been lost for three days had been found. And if you read the rest of this story in chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, the prophet Samuel told Saul, Look, your father is no longer worried about those donkeys that are lost. Now he's worried about you being lost. He's worried that something has happened. 
the need. So here in this story, we see the example of two gifts of the Spirit in operation. One is word of wisdom. Tomorrow about this time, there's a man coming. And then the word of knowledge. Hey, the, you just tell Saul that the, the lost donkeys have been found. And now your father's worried about you being lost. Now, the prophet Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 5. You know this story. It's the story of Naaman, the leper being cleansed after dipping in the Jordan River seven times. Just as the prophet Elisha instructed him to do. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. Naaman was so thankful that for being cleansed, he wanted to give the prophet Elisha gifts. But he refused, verses 20 through 27. But Elisha's servant, Gehazi, he said to him, Hey, my master wouldn't take the gifts that Naaman offered, but I sure will. Verse 22, Gehazi lied, and he told Naaman, Hey, my, my master has sent me, and he's asking for one talent of silver, two changes of garments, because uh, we've had some unexpected visitors coming, and, and we need some money after all. So verse 20, 23, Naaman was so thankful for being healed, and he said, Here, take two talents of silver and two changes of garments. And I was reading, doing some research, and it said that the one talent in our day, in our dollars, was approximately sixteen to nineteen thousand dollars. So Naaman's getting two talents, and can you imagine? It took two servants to carry this silver. Can you imagine? You tried to carry thirty-two to. A, $40,000 in quarters and, and change. No, you couldn't do it. So it took two servants to carry all this money. And so Gehazi, he hid this money in the clothes, verse 24. Then he went back to stand in the presence of his master, the prophet Elisha. Verse 25, Elisha asked Gehazi, hey, where'd you go, boy? Gehazi said, what? Who, me? Elisha says, verse 26, and he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is this a time to receive money and to receive garments? He knew exactly what Gehazi had taken. Verse 27, the leprosy there for of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. Elisha knew by the gift of the word of knowledge what his servant Gehazi had done. And judgment came upon Gehazi for lying. Not only did he become a leper, but all of his children and his grandchildren did also. Wow, God hates lying, doesn't he? Gehazi became a leper, and we studied in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira fell down dead for lying. In both instances, their actions were revealed through the gift of the word of knowledge. And jot the scripture down. The word of God says in Proverbs chapter 16, verses 16 through 17. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue. Lying is second on the list of things that God hates. Wow! And these men operated in the gift of the word of knowledge to expose that these people were lying. Wouldn't you love to operate in the gift of the word of knowledge? You can because the Lord wants to use you in all of the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 tells us to desire spiritual gifts. And we first of all have to want to operate, want to be used of the Holy Spirit to end the gifts. And then learn how to listen to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and then be obedient to follow his leadership. And I am sure that you have had times 
you may you haven't recognized that it was the gift of word of knowledge, but if you were felt impressed to just call a friend on the phone or call a neighbor and say, Hey, I had you on my heart today. And before the conversation was over, they would say, Oh, I'm so glad you was you called me. I've been so discouraged. Oh, you have just helped me so much. Why? What was that? Why did you feel impressed to call that person? The Holy Spirit was giving you a word of knowledge to call them, encourage them. And I have had times, many times over the years, where the gift of the word of knowledge has operated in my ministry. And just to give you a few examples so that you will understand more how to recognize in the gift of word of knowledge. Now remember, as a teacher, we don't tell personal stories and about things that have happened and ramble on and on and on. Like a lot of preachers, they'll tell personal experiences and never get around to the subject they're supposed to be preaching on. They just chase rabbit trails, tell one story after another <laughs> rambling. As a teacher, we want to jump up and say, shoot that rabbit and get back <laughs> on your subject that you're supposed to be preaching. So, if I'm going to tell you a personal experience, what does that experience have to do with what I am teaching, the subject I'm covering that day? Years ago, I had the opportunity when I worked at, at a certain job, I was on salary, I did payroll, so I de deliberately deducted one day's pay a week from my paycheck, and I took off one day a week. I spent that entire day in the Word and in prayer. I went to a friend's house that they were gone at work, and I had the whole house. I spent the whole day. I spent eight to ten hours that day in the Word and praying in the Holy Spirit. One day I was praying, and I don't know if I had a vision like Ananias. I don't know if I, I just saw it in the spirit or if I was actually taken, transported, or translated to a different city. Uh, but I was there. I opened my eyes, and I was in a big city. I saw the flashing neon lights. And then suddenly the scene changed, and I saw this Spanish man running down the street. And a look of fear, horror, terror was on his face. And I looked and there were three or four men chasing after him with knives. And this this man, I knew by the spirit his name was Pedro. How did I know that? It was the gift of word of knowledge. And I knew by the spirit also that he was being chased because of a drug deal that had gone bad. And these men, they were gaining on Pedro, and Pedro was running, running, he looked up behind him, looked over his shoulder, and they were closing in on him, and he was running and running and running toward a black vehicle, and I was praying harder, harder, harder in, in the spirit as Pedro ran faster, but he, he was losing ground, and he finally reached his vehicle, unlocked it, jumped in, locked the car door back, and just as these men surrounded his car, two of them, one on each side, they, they was trying to open the car door, but since it was locked in, they took their knives, they were trying to slash his tires. One of the men jumped up on his hood, turned his knife to the handle part, and was beating the windshield, trying to break that windshield. And, and there was just such a look of hatred on this man's face, just anger, violence, hatred, as he was pounding on that windshield. But I saw as Pedro cranked that car up, and he, sp he sped off, and these men went flying in all directions, and he was safe. And suddenly, I was back in the living room in that recliner, sweat was pouring off my face, and I said, God, you use me to save this man's life through prayer and intercession and giving me a word of knowledge concerning his life being in danger. And I said, and Pedro, I'll see you in heaven. I just prayed and claimed him for the kingdom of God. I said, you may be on drugs, you may be a drug dealer, and all that's why you almost lost your life, but 
You're going to be born again, and I'll see you in heaven, and I will. And let me give you one other example of my mom. I told you before how long was a woman of prayer. She stayed on her face. She prayed for us three kids. We didn't have a chance but to serve and live for God. And time after time, I saw my mom operate in the gift of the word of knowledge. She didn't know what it was. She was just a little Baptist girl. She wasn't even filled with the Spirit. But yet she stayed on her face and prayed. She prayed for me time after time. From the age of 16 to 21, I did not make one good decision. Not one. I went through those rebellious teenage years when most mothers would give up and say, you're not ever going to amount to anything. But not my mama. My mama was a woman who would not let go of God. She kept praying for me. And I'm in the ministry today fulfilling the call of God on my life because my mama stayed on her face. And so from the years of 16 to 21, I call them my idiot years. I did not make one good decision. Every decision I made was bad. I joined the military at age 18 as soon as I got out of school. Didn't tell mom until two weeks before I was leaving for basic training. Then I got married, which was the most stupid thing I have ever done in my life. But that happened during my idiot years. And then he wanted a divorce. It was his decision, not mine. I thought my world would come to an end, but now I see it was the best thing that ever happened because God didn't join us together. God didn't have one thing to do with that. was my decision. When I wasn't serving God and living for God, I made that decision. And I wouldn't be in the ministry today. Why? Because he was an alcoholic, lived an ungodly life, and he been somewhere in the military. Who knows where? But one, one time when I was 16, remember, through those years, idiot years, I look back and I say, wow, who hit you with a stupid stick? I mean, good grief. How stupid can you get? I was dating this this guy, 16 years old, ungodly as they come. Mother could not stand him. She said, I do not want you dating this boy. Well, in my rebellious teenage years, my idiot years, I'm going to do it or die. So I tell mom, mom, I'm going over to a friend's house. I'm going over to daddy's house. Well, I might go by daddy's house, but I would meet this boy and go out on a date. Well, when I get home at night, my mom would say, where you been? Just like Elisha, I just got angry. She said, so where you been? And I said, oh, I've been to a friend's house. She said, no. Nope. No, you wasn't. You went out with that boy, and you went to a picture show, didn't you? She never called it movies. She called it a picture show. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. No, I was over at Daddy's house. She had point that finger at me, and it looked like it reached all the way across the room and hit me between the eyes. And I say, no, Mom, she would say, I know where you was. You was with that boy, you went to a picture show, and then you went here, here, and here. And I'd walk away shaking. How did you know that? Just shaking my head, thinking, Mom, how in the world did she know that? Because she was on her face praying, and the Holy Spirit told her, Holy Spirit, you're a tattletale. And I'm glad. Because that saved me time and again. If I'd have married that man, he was as ungodly as they come. Oh, my life would have been a train wreck. But, but then at age 21, it was like I woke up one day after those idiot years, and it was like I could think rational again. And I dedicated my life back to the Lord is, is the thing. And I'll give you one more quick example of operating in the gift of the word of knowledge. My mom, our neighbors would call her continually and say, I have a need, or so-and-so is sick. And, and then she would pray, and she would hear the word of the Lord, and she would tell them the answer. She would tell them the answer to the problem they were going through, or whatever that need was. And I had the, the Lord just impressed me. Here, for over the years, I've done a lot of, of ministry in churches, and I'm invited to come and speak, and during this, while I was up teaching, 
I might see an individual and I would just know by, by the gift of the word of knowledge, hey, they're going through a problem. They need prayer concerning a job or they need healing this in this certain area of their body. Time after time after time or they may come up in the prayer line and, as, and I would begin to pray and the Holy Spirit would begin to give me scriptures concerning healing and they may have not even mentioned a healing need. What, or whatever that need was in that person's life, I would just begin to pray the scriptures concerning that need. How would I know that? I would have no way in the natural of knowing that. No way possible that I would know what your need is unless the Holy Spirit revealed it to me by the gift of the word of knowledge. And several years ago, we had an interim pastor, and uh, his name was Joe, and he was a mighty man of God, a great prophet of God, and the Holy Spirit would just impress me to pray for Joe, pray for Joe. I remember once I was at the gas pump, pumping gas, and it, the spirit of intercession just came over me, and I began to weep and cry, tears strolling down my face as I was pumping that gas, praying for Joe, praying for Joe. And one day when I was praying for Joe, I said, Lord, what is the problem? And instantly I saw a heart and a beating, and then I saw a hole form in that heart. And I knew that Joe's life was in danger. I knew that the devil was going to try to take him out with a heart attack because he was such a great prophet of God, a mighty man of the word, and ministered to so many people. And I was faithful to pray, faithful to pray for months. And then one day one of the elders came and said to me, pray for Joe. He's having problems with his heart, and he's going to a heart specialist next week. And I told him, I've already been praying for Joe. I've been praying diligently for Joe. And one day, Joe came up to me and after service, and he said, pray for me. And I said, brother, I have been praying for you. And I knew not to say, hey, you've got a hole in your heart, and the devil is going to try to bring a heart attack on you, because that would have brought fear. Fear. And Job said, the thing which I greatly fear has come upon me. So I do keep your mouth shut. If the Holy Spirit shows you something about a person, that doesn't mean you run and tell them. And so I knew not to say it out of my mouth because it would have brought fear on him and the enemy would have tried to have put that heart attack on him. And I just told him, I've been praying for you and I'll continue to pray for you. And then the... That, that burden lifted, and I knew that Joe was healed. Without surgery, I knew that God had intervened. And he's still alive and in the ministry today, and that's been over 30 years ago. Why? Because I was obedient to listen to the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit gave me a word of knowledge that he had a heart problem, a hole in his heart, and the enemy was going to try to kill him with a heart attack, I knew by the gift of the word of knowledge to pray for him, to intercede for him. Don't you want to operate in that gift too? Wouldn't it be awesome if the Holy Spirit spoke to you and said, hey, pray for a relative, a child, a, a daughter, grand, grandson, whoever it is, pray for them because the enemy, it, the enemy is making them sick. The enemy is going to is trying to put cancer on them. They're sick. But you're obedient to pray for them and you see God's healing hand of mercy touch them, raise them up, heal them, hold well. Don't you want to operate in this gift of the word of God? You can. You are to desire spiritual gifts, desire for the Lord to use you to operate in these gifts. The Lord wants to use you. He desires to use you even more than you do because people are hurting. People have needs. Christians especially because the enemy is attacking us continually, trying to put sickness, trying to bring problems, trying to get us discouraged, trying to shut our mouths, ministers, to keep us from ministering the Word of God. But if you will be obedient and desire, say, God, use me. 
Use me to help people. Use me to help my friends that don't know you as in the workplace. Use me to help that stranger that I'm seeing and coming down the aisle at Walmart. And the Holy Spirit said to give you a word of knowledge concerning that person. And you can walk up to them and say, Brother, the Lord shows me. And watch tears form in their eyes and say, how did you know that? Yes, I'm going through that need. Wouldn't that be awesome? I tell you, living for the Lord and following the leadership of the Holy Spirit and allowing him to use you and the gift, I tell you, there's nothing like it. That, that is fun. I tell you, it is awesome to be used of the Spirit. What, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's not here on earth anymore working miracles. That's why we are the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus. He wants to use each of you in the gifts of the Holy Spirit to minister to other people. Can you say amen? amen. 